Your lecturer is Gregory S. Aldretti. Dr. Aldretti has been honored with a number of teaching awards and fellowships, and he has written and edited several books, including Daily Life in the Roman City and Gestures and Acclamations in Ancient Rome. Our story begins with a man surveying the chaotic aftermath of a ferocious naval battle. The time is around 4 p.m. on the afternoon of September 2nd, 31 BC. The place is a stretch of open water off the western coast of Greece, at the point where the Ambracian Gulf opens onto the Ionian Sea. The man is an ambitious 31-year-old Roman politician named Gaius Julius Caesar Octavianus, commonly referred to as Octavian. The event will be recorded in history as the Battle of Actium, and its outcome has just made Octavian the ruler of the known world. Ancient sources tell us details of what Octavian saw as he stood on the deck of his flagship late on that September afternoon. A steadily strengthening offshore wind whipped up the surface of the water into choppy waves that hindered the efforts of the weary survivors to secure their battered ships and to rescue the thousands of men still struggling in the water. Hundreds of wooden warships had been either destroyed or damaged in a fairly small space during the course of the battle, and their broken and half-sunk hulls littered the sea. Dozens of these wrecks burned or smoldered because Octavian's crews had used flaming missiles hurled from ballistae in the latter stages of the battle in order to subdue their remaining opponents. Tens of thousands of men had been killed during the clash, slain by arrows or swords in hand-to-hand -hand combat, crushed when an enemy warship smashed into their vessel with a bronze ram, burned to death on ships set afire by the flaming missiles, or probably most commonly drowned in the Ionian Sea when their warship was destroyed or disabled. Their corpses bobbed in the rough waters alongside other detritus from the battle, such as broken oars, shattered timbers, and torn sails. The Battle of Actium was a decisive turning point in world history because it brought about the end of one major phase and denoted the start of another. It was the moment that marked the final collapse of the Roman Republic and resulted in the creation of the Roman Empire. Octavian's victory at Actium was the culmination of over half a century of destructive civil wars that had torn apart the Roman Republic and undermined its institutions. The Roman Republic had come into being 500 years earlier when the you know, then small and honestly rather insignificant city-state of Rome had overthrown the last of its kings and established in their place a form of government that shared political power among a group of citizens. The important offices in the government were filled by annual elections, in which all citizens cast votes for their favorite candidates. While this might sound quite democratic, real power was concentrated in the hands of a set of influential, wealthy families from whose ranks almost all of the elected magistrates were chosen. Nevertheless, it was a far more uh, egalitarian system than the monarchies, which were the standard political structure of the time. And it succeeded in harnessing the abilities 
and energy of a broad segment of the citizen body. Although not all citizens were truly equal, Roman citizenship did convey significant benefits and protections, as well as responsibilities, most notably service in the military. Rome liked to think of itself at this time as a nation of tough and pragmatic farmer, citizen, soldiers. And there's a fair amount of truth to this stereotype. As is usually the case in the ancient world, however, it's worth keeping in mind that even in the relatively radical political structure of the Roman Republic, large segments of the populace, such as women and slaves, were excluded from full participation in the system and had an inferior legal and social status. Over the next several centuries, the city of Rome gradually conquered its neighbors and expanded its territory, first in central Italy and then throughout the entire peninsula. In these early wars, Rome was neither technologically nor tactically superior to its foes, and its army was really only a citizen militia. But the Roman people did display a dogged resilience and determination, so that even when they suffered repeated military defeats and, and outright disasters, they simply regrouped and came back until they finally won. Rome also pursued an unusual policy with regard to its defeated enemies in Italy. Rather than enslaving the conquered people, Rome more typically shared uh, gradated degrees of membership in the Roman system with them, bestowing full citizenship on a few favored elites, awarding half citizenship to some, and giving others the status of allies. Each of these categories came with a distinct level of rights and responsibilities, but all had the effect of incorporating and Romanizing these former enemies. The one universal requirement for all was to provide troops to the Roman army, a practice which encouraged further conquests and gave Rome a decisive edge in battle by affording them nearly inexhaustible manpower reserves. By about 250 BC, Rome had brought the entire Italian peninsula under its sway, and then immediately launched into a series of wars with overseas foes. The greatest and most dangerous of these were the Punic Wars, fought against the rival, up-and-coming empire of Carthage. Under the inspired leadership of Hannibal, uh, one of history's great military geniuses, Carthage nearly defeated Rome. But in the end, the Romans prevailed, and they emerged from the crucible of the Punic Wars hardened and with a formidable, well-trained, and semi-professional military that would prove superior to any contemporary Mediterranean opponents. At the beginning of the second century BC, by which time Rome had established hegemony over the western Mediterranean, it was the eastern half that was in reality the more affluent, more urban, and far more culturally sophisticated area. The east was the Hellenistic world, ruled by a set of powerful kingdoms which were formed out of the breakup of Alexander the Great's empire, and they were all dominated by erudite Greek culture. To the wealthy and refined peoples of the East, the Romans seemed like uncouth and crude brutes. 
Although the Romans may have been culturally unsophisticated, they were dynamic and possessed a highly efficient military, and they burst onto the Hellenistic world like an explosion. In a few decades, they smashed their way across the eastern Mediterranean, toppling one proud Hellenistic kingdom after another. These conquests came as quite a shock to the Greeks, but there was little they could do to resist the Roman juggernaut. When Rome moved outside of Italy, it adopted a new policy towards conquered regions, becoming less generous in bestowing degrees of citizenship, and instead treating these areas as subjugated zones, organized administratively into tax-paying Roman provinces under the rule of a Roman governor. The vanquishing of the Hellenized Eastern Mediterranean had several long-term effects on Rome. First, Rome acquired riches on a vast scale. The income of the Roman state was multiplied many times over, and certain individuals, particularly members of the ruling elite, became wealthy as well. Second, the Romans adopted much of Greek culture and incorporated it into their own. Roman society was intensely competitive, and Roman aristocrats were constantly vying with one another for prestige and status. Greek culture offered yet another arena for competition. And so, upper-class Romans learned to speak Greek. They ostentatiously dropped quotations from Greek authors into their speeches and letters. They tried to amass the largest collection of stolen Greek vases and statuary. And they strove to outdo one another in their knowledge of and facility with Greek culture. Rome had been stunningly successful in conquering the Mediterranean. But these external triumphs ended up creating dire internal problems in the Roman Republic. The fruits of conquest were not evenly distributed. And by the dawn of the first century BC, nearly every segment of society was burning with resentment. The half-citizens and allies in Italy, uh, the people who had done much of the fighting and dying in Rome's wars over the last several centuries, they felt it was long overdue for Rome to reward all their efforts by extending full citizenship to them. And they were right. Many ordinary Roman citizens had left their traditional small family farms and gone off to fight in the wars with dreams of coming home rich. But when the spoils were ultimately distributed, they were left out. And these veterans came home impoverished after their years of service. Even worse, many of their farms had been sold so that they ended up homeless or underemployed. Millions of foreigners had been killed or enslaved in the course of Rome's conquests, and many of these slaves, who had been torn from their homelands, now labored on plantations in Italy. Even among the elite families who on the surface were the big winners in all of this, there was widespread resentment because over time, power had become increasingly concentrated into the hands of an ever smaller number of individuals who monopolized the plum generalships, the most desirable government offices, and the chances to gain fame and glory. Thus, in an odd paradox, 
the spectacular achievements of Roman imperialism had resulted in nearly every group in Roman society feeling unhappy. These resentments steadily grew until they boiled over during the late Republic, uh, conventionally defined as the period between a failed attempt at reform in 133 BC and the Battle of Actium in 31 BC. As the Republic staggered along under increasing strain, its institutions and traditions were eroded. This era also saw the rise of a series of dangerous strongmen who put their personal ambitions above the good of the state. The first of these were a rival pair of warlords, Marius and Sulla, who set a number of destructive precedents that further undermined the Republic and its institutions. They were followed by a second duo of even more ambitious and precedent-breaking commanders, Pompey the Great and Julius Caesar. Their rivalry ended in a cataclysmic civil war from which Caesar emerged the winner. While Caesar's talents brought him military victory, he failed to find a way to rule Rome as one man without provoking the Romans a traditional and extreme antipathy to monarchy. Now, it didn't help that he acted in an arrogant manner and openly disrespected other Roman aristocrats as well as the traditions of the Republic, going so far as to declare himself dictator for life. The predictable result was that he was assassinated by a conspiracy of senators on the Ides of March, 44 BC. Caesar's death created a power vacuum that a number of groups and individuals then sought to fill. These included several of Caesar's former officers, most notably Marcus Antonius, uh, often simply called Mark Antony, and various senatorial factions, among them Caesar's assassins, now billing themselves as the liberators. Of all these, Mark Antony was clearly the strongest and in the best position to step into Caesar's shoes and take control of the Roman state. In a surprise development, however, when Caesar's will was read, it was discovered that he had posthumously adopted as his son a previously unknown and undistinguished grandnephew known as Octavian. At the time, this Octavian was still a teenager, and although he inherited little besides a name from Caesar, he proved to be an extremely clever and manipulative young man, parlaying his link to Caesar into a certain degree of political power and becoming one of the rivals vying to take Caesar's place. In the decade following Caesar's assassination, Antony, Octavian, and other former Caesarian officers temporarily aligned to defeat the liberators and the Senate. But ultimately, they turned on one another. Eventually, it came down to just Antony and Octavian, who deferred their final confrontation for quite a while. In the meantime, effectively dividing up the Roman world between them, with Antony holding the richer eastern half and Octavian controlling the west, including Rome itself. During this period, Antony encountered Cleopatra, the ruler of Egypt, which was the last remaining major independent kingdom on the shores of the Mediterranean. The two embarked on a famous love affair a union that Octavian was able to exploit for propaganda purposes by depicting Antony as having fallen under the seductive spell of a dangerous foreign queen, a narrative that played upon a number of traditional Roman phobias. War was inevitable, and when it finally broke out, 
it seemed as if Antony might have the edge. He had a large and loyal army, could call upon the substantial wealth and resources of his ally, Cleopatra, and possessed a huge advantage over Octavian when it came to ability as a general. Octavian countered by playing to his strengths, using propaganda to successfully portray what was in reality a civil war between two Romans as a conflict that pitted him as the defender of the Roman Republic against a conniving foreign queen and her Roman dupe. Octavian even maneuvered the Senate into declaring Cleopatra an official enemy of the Roman state. Although a terrible general himself, Octavian could also draw upon the talents of a loyal and self-effacing friend, Marcus Agrippa, a gifted admiral and general who was willing to fight Octavian's battles for him, but allow Octavian to claim all the credit. The war of Octavian versus Antony and Cleopatra culminated in the Battle of Actium, won in crushing fashion by Agrippa's fleet. And so, we return to the scene which began this lecture, of Octavian standing upon the deck of his flagship late in the afternoon of September 2nd, 31 BC, surveying the wreckage bobbing on the waves in the aftermath of his great victory. Just one thing, however, marred his moment of triumph. While Antony's fleet had been nearly totally sunk or captured, and most of Antony's legions had been either destroyed outright or helplessly stranded and thoroughly demoralized, Antony and Cleopatra themselves had managed to sneak through the cordon of Agrippa's warships and escape to Egypt. As long as they remained free, the war could not really be declared over, and therefore Octavian now turned his attention to their pursuit. First, however, he had to briefly return to Italy in order to arrange rewards for some of his own long-serving legions who were threatening mutiny. This entailed a dangerous wintertime crossing of the Mediterranean, and despite his ship suffering severe storm damage, losing a rudder, and having its rigging torn away, Octavian made it to Italy. There, he soothed the disgruntled troops, and after only a month, returned to the east to organize the assault on Egypt. Antony and Cleopatra still posed a credible threat, since Cleopatra could draw upon the substantial wealth of Egypt, and Antony still possessed a significant military forces. Most importantly, four experienced Roman legions in Cyrenaica, located in North Africa, west of Egypt. Octavian swiftly removed the latter menace by persuading all four of the Cyrenaican legions to desert over to his side. Octavian then launched a two-pronged attack on Egypt, with the turncoat Cyrenaican legions advancing from the west, and Octavian leading another army into Egypt from the east. No one wants to stay on a sinking ship, and by now it was clear to all that Antony's fortunes were foundering. His men were demoralized, and more and more troops began to abandon his cause. The deteriorating mood of his men is exemplified by an embarrassing incident. Uh, after Antony won a minor cavalry skirmish, uh, in an effort to boost morale, he singled out one of the soldiers who had fought bravely and had Cleopatra publicly honor the man by awarding him a golden helmet and breastplate. The soldier took the valuable prizes and promptly deserted to Octavian's side. Seeing his best chance in a pitched battle where his superior generalship might give him the edge, 
Antony boldly led his entire army and navy out to confront Octavian's forces. But instead of fighting, straight away, all his warships switched sides, and all his soldiers simply ran from the battlefield. In despair, Antony returned to Alexandria determined to commit suicide rather than suffer the humiliation of being captured by Octavian. Even this turned into a humiliating debacle. The servant who Antony ordered to stab him killed himself instead. Antony was then forced to fall on his own sword, but only succeeded in inflicting an agonizing but not immediately fatal stomach wound. Unable to find anyone who would finish him off, he then went to see Cleopatra, who had taken refuge in a mausoleum. However, because the doors had already been sealed, in order to gain entrance, Antony had to be tied to a rope and awkwardly and painfully hoisted up into the structure like a sack of grain. There he at last expired in Cleopatra's arms. Octavian triumphantly took possession of Alexandria, of Egypt and its riches, and of Cleopatra herself, who, contrary to Hollywood depictions, did not kill herself right away. The surviving sources are not in agreement on the sequence of events, but it seems to have been at least a week later when she died. Officially, she perished by allowing a poisonous asp to bite her. But she may have been quietly killed at Octavian's order, who then announced that she had committed suicide. There is no doubt that Octavian had several lesser members of her family executed at this time, including two teenage boys, Caesarian, who was Cleopatra's son with Julius Caesar, and Antillus, who was Antony's eldest son from a previous marriage. Octavian did, however, spare Antony and Cleopatra's other younger children. With the treasury of Egypt in his possession, Octavian was able to pay off his veterans adequately. He also indulged in a bit of tourism in the famous city of Alexandria. He was most eager to pay his respects at the tomb of Alexander the Great, uh, which contained the legendary conqueror's embalmed body. With the subjugation of Egypt, Octavian had become the ruler of the known world, just as Alexander had been. And in a nice coincidence, Octavian at this moment was 33 years old, the exact age Alexander had been when he died. Up until now, Octavian had stamped documents using a signet ring that was engraved with a sphinx. Now, Octavian replaced it with one that bore an image of Alexander. Octavian's moment of reverence was marred, however, when he clumsily knocked the nose off Alexander's corpse. Octavian returned to Rome in August of 30 BC and celebrated a triple triumph in which the loot acquired in Egypt was paraded through the streets of the city, along with a float bearing an effigy of the defeated Cleopatra. Octavian lost no time in attempting to put his own spin on his defeat of Antony, downplaying the fact that it had really been a civil war, and instead stressing that he was the person who had brought peace to the Mediterranean after decades of unrest and violence. As a symbol of this role, he decreed that the doors of the Temple of Janus be ritually closed an act that only occurred when Rome was at peace. He claimed that this was only the third instance when this had ever happened. The memory of Antony was systematically besmirched. 
His birthday was labeled a day of ill omen, and orders went out that all of his statues should be smashed. Meanwhile, to bolster his own popularity, Octavian bestowed largesse upon the Romans on an unprecedented scale, distributing 400 sesterces to every citizen, granting land to veterans, canceling taxes, and staging spectacles for the entertainment of the people that presented novelties such as wild beast hunts featuring the slaughter of a rhino and a hippo, exotic creatures never before seen at Rome. Despite all his accomplishments, Octavian might have gone down in history as just another Roman warlord in the mold of Marius or Sulla or even Julius Caesar, who had achieved momentary dominance and then passed from the stage. But it is what Octavian did next that sets him apart from all these men and makes him truly one of the most influential figures in history. This is because Octavian found a way to solve the puzzle that Caesar could not. How to rule Rome as one man and not be killed for being too like a king. Not only would Octavian crack this difficult riddle, but he would become Rome's first emperor. And the political system that he created would endure for the next half a millennium. This system would become the template for countless later empires up through the present day, and he himself would become the model emperor against whom all subsequent ones would be measured. The culture and history of the Mediterranean Basin, the Western world, and even global history itself were all profoundly shaped and influenced by the actions and legacy of Octavian. He was the founder of the Roman Empire, and we still live today in the world that he created. Over the following 23 lectures of this course, we will trace the remarkable history of the Roman Empire from its foundation by Octavian through its golden age in the second century AD, and then a series of ever worsening crises until its eventual decay and collapse. Along the way, we will encounter an array of other emperors and their deeds, from the grandiose and cruel actions of the mentally unstable Caligula and Nero, to the stoic philosophy of Marcus Aurelius, to the startling conversion of Constantine to Christianity. We will, of course, study the famous characters and major historical events of Roman history, and survey the influential art, architecture, poetry, and literature produced by the Romans. But we will also delve deeply into the lives of ordinary Roman women and men, and discover their experiences and perspectives. Towards this goal, we will scrutinize the messages that they left for posterity on their tombstones, or scribbled on the walls as graffiti examine what life was really like for the average city dweller in ancient Rome and what hazards he or she had to cope with in everyday life. And we will analyze what it was really like to spend a day at one of Rome's spectacular public entertainments, such as gladiator games and chariot races. We will begin our journey in the next lecture by investigating Octavian's ingenious solution to Caesar's puzzle and his innovative actions in creating the role of emperor and organizing the structure and institutions of the empire. So, please join me on this exploration of the history and culture of the Roman Empire.